Our order of service is printed in the worship folder with most of the music as well as on our PowerPoint. Let us rise and sing our first song, You Walk Along Our Shoreline.
Loving God, gracious Father, your loving kindness always goes before us and follows after us. Summon us into your light and direct our steps in the ways of goodness that come through the cross of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. Our first reading is from the book of Jonah, chapter 3, verses 1 to 5 and 10. The book of Jonah, chapter 3, verses 1 to 5 and 10. The word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time, saying, Get up and go to Nineveh, that great city, and proclaim to it the message that I tell you. So Jonah set out and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly large city, a three days walk across. Jonah began to go into the city, going a day's walk. And he cried out, Forty days more and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And the people of Nineveh believed God. They proclaimed a fast and everyone, great and small, put on sackcloth. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil ways, God changed his mind about the calamity that he had said he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The epistle reading is from the first letter of St. Paul to Corinthians, Chapter 7, verses 29 to 31. 1 Corinthians, chapter 7, verses 29 to 31. St. Paul writes, I mean, brothers and sisters, the appointed time has grown short. From now on, let even those who have wives be as though they had none, and those who mourn as though they were not mourning and those who rejoice as though they were not rejoicing, and those who buy as though they had no possessions, and those who deal with the world as, they, as though they had no dealings with it. For the present form of this world is passing away. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Please rise for the gospel verse. According to St. Mark chapter 1, verses 14 to 20. Glory to you, o Lord. After John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. As Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come follow me, Jesus said and I will send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and followed him. When he had gone a little farther, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John in a boat, preparing their nets. Without delay he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. God has made us his people through our baptism into Christ. Living together in trust and hope, we confess the faith. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand. Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness 
of men. So it doesn't matter if we're not good fishermen, but it's God who can make anybody, even us who are not fishermen, into fishers of men. Sharing his love to us and the rest of the world. Praise Heavenly Father, we thank you that no matter what, May God fill you all with great hope and joy and peace in your believing. Amen. The message today for the third Sunday after Epiphany is from the prophet Jonah, chapter 3. The account of his facing the big, great, evil city and how God changes his mind. 
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Prophet Jonah is one of my favorite biblical people, apart from Jesus in the Gospel accounts. My other favorite is Apostle Thomas, who he and Jonah have a lot in common, actually. They have common threads in their personality, as most of us have those same traits. Jonah didn't want to be God's prophetic voice. Personally, as a young person, I wasn't in desire of the ministry either. Church people I grew up with saw that in me. My pastor very subtly put me on that path. Sometimes a person would say to me, Oh, yes, love life, still live in the dream. I usually respond, Well... I'm living God's dream. I'm not sure it's mine, but I've learned to accept it. That's the key. That's the key connection we have with Jonah and those like him, accepting the path God unfolds for us. No one has to be in love with what they do or how their life changes as in a celebrity sort of way. It's entering into a life of trust without always controlling the outcomes, at least not fully. Letting the Holy Spirit empower, propel, push us forward. For it is God's grace alone that has even kept me into the ministry nearly 25 years. You need God no matter what life brings your way. I get a prophet Jonah. I get the disinterest in God's calling. He's not frightened. He's just not really into it. Preaching love to Israel's enemy? Uh, No thanks. He's got to be on the right side of history. That's important. Being on the right side of history. And Jonah himself, though, isn't on that right side. He thinks he's doing what's best for himself and Israel's salvation history by not wanting to let Nineveh off the hook. And then he follows his own desires, but eventually God brings him back to where he wants him. Being on the right side of history, that's a phrase we hear about a lot now. And in a way, it's an attempt to learn from the past that not every enemy is always 100% evil and not every good guy is 100% righteous. But taking the side of the suffering as our Lord Jesus had done is always good. But this takes me back actually to my last year of university, 1995. I got elected president of our student art department club. And that covered all the fine arts, the music, even the English departments. And my first duty as president, not to bring in coffee, not to have more showings in our galleries, but I had to help organize and lead a Buffalo-wide boycott of the then new Key Bank Sabres Arena, you might remember when that was being built, which had planned to drain dollars from the arts and theater budget. So we all visited businesses, we were all fired up, we made flyers, even formed a protest line with fellow marchers and nearly got arrested because nah, the police weren't all so sympathetic to that cause. But looking back, it was a wonderful experience and the arts community still thrives and if, any, if nothing else, long before the internet, it created awareness of how public money can be spent. But no one wakes up in the morning and decides, oh, I'm going to be a leader or a prophet. They are chosen. They are led through God's plan, through the vocations he gives us in the world. And we all know it's not easy. We know about Jonah in the whale's belly, but we don't know much else. He lived about uh, six, seven hundred years before Jesus' birth. God wants him as a prophet, much to his discontent. The idea of going all the way from Israel to Nineveh, which was a big city in today's Iraq region, that turns him off. He expects no one to listen, number one, and Nineveh looms large, a city that takes three days' journey to walk through. They're famous for their cruelty in combat and capital punishment, hated by Israel and any neighboring land, and some of it is well-placed fear, some of it is myth and superstition. The call to face Nineveh makes Jonah quickly board a ship to Joppa, uh, that's near the Mediterranean coast, near today's Tel Aviv. Tarshish is the goal, and that's what is believed to be modern Spain, the opposite direction, really, of Nineveh. But our reading today happens after Jonah gets thrown overboard to calm the waters of the storm. He's in the whale's stomach three days and gets spit up onto dry land and begins facing Nineveh. God saved his life for a purpose. He wants these other people saved just as he wants Jonah and Israel saved. 
And God speaks to him a second time now. And then he goes to where he didn't want to go. And walks in the city barely one day's journey, speaking a direct short phrase, 40 days more and Nineveh will be overthrown. Now Jonah's speech, if you look into the Hebrew language where it's written in, is almost borders on what we'd call verbally abusive. It's loud, probably angry, overthrown in the Hebrew, supposedly comes from words that were anchored in in old farming communities, like overturning the dead, dry soil so new crops can be planted. So they either will do something different in 40 days or God will just make nothing out of them. And there's a tone. The Hebrew words even tell us there's a tone, there's an attitude. And tone of voice, as we know, is as much of a communicator as words, if not more. Ask an unsettled person how they are, and the way they say, I'm fine, can say many things. <laughs> Jonah is aggravated and maybe somewhat privileged. He's on God's side, and he enjoys preaching the threat of harm. Of all the messages to deliver, Jonah gives one sentence of upheaval. But God knows where he's at, as he does all of us, and chooses immediate, full-on compassion, mercy, and hope. When we have news to share that we do not want to, that may be... We're okay, but we want somebody else not to be okay. We, it, it causes us aggravation, upheaval in our own selves. The upheaval we want is the upheaval we get. The late Arthur, author Mark Twain once wrote about Jonah and said he just hadn't traveled enough because Jonah was holding on tightly to his prejudice, his narrow-mindedness about the people of Nineveh. Well, that's kind of true. We really only love God as much as we can love the person we love the least. Think about that. No sooner are Jonah's words spoken and that entire city is repenting. From the king on the throne down to the donkeys in the stall. Sackcloth and ashes, which is a sign of mourning for the Jews, not for the Gentiles. The whole city refrains from its evil, its activity, even stops eating. Wow, that really is amazing. Enemies of Israel change their ways after hearing Jonah. Now it makes us ask, well, did that repentance last? Who knows? Not sure, but unfortunately their war machine, according to Jewish biblical, uh, extra-biblical history, said the war machine continued long after Jonah's time, and in less than 100 years, Nineveh got destroyed by what is now modern Iran. They were called Medes then. But our God is a God of second chances. Jonah didn't understand that we don't get to tell God whom he should love. God desires a relationship, and that takes trust and love and time and patience. He smiles on the sorrow of those who turn away for, from their sinful paths. He validated Nineveh's outward changes, and he saved them. But there's no biblical record of any of that in, in that city becoming followers of the promised Savior who is still to come. But repentance also doesn't grow just from God's law. Reading over the Ten Commandments won't keep anyone from making mistakes. Thinking God will strike us down will not create a love-based following. Repentance grows from the gospel, the good news that God fills you with his Holy Spirit, and that spirit arrives with the power to make your waywardness into a win for God. The spirit gives you and I the gifts that make repentance a reality every moment of every day. And when it doesn't happen, when the fruit of our lives grows bitter, that is really just our own lack of trust. We still want to do it our way on our time frame. And our way never works. God's way always works. The key is that he shares as he lines our, his will up with ours. And he makes our, his path become our path as though we don't even think we had our own path. That's how God works. And that's the gospel that transforms. Grace grows repentance. Jesus' cross frames all that we say and do. Because the gospel of Jesus sets the tone. And what about the tone of the church in our world? Not just ours here, but all around the world. Is the tone of church as one of love or hypocrisy? If we want to call people to respond to God's grace and mercy, our tone is as important as our words. Yet I know so many people who've been put off from church and Christianity, not by the message really, but by the tone communicated by the messenger. We are called by God to genuinely love the stranger, the neighbor, those who are different than we are, and yes, even any enemy. Now, does that make us 
Embrace change or stand like a monument, hoping we'll outlast it all. It's God's nature to love. He loves us. He loves all. And that means showing grace to all. Because God loves us so much and he is just so eager to forgive us from turning away from him as he is for everybody else that we don't even know yet. And God forgives you, so you and I forgive. We let go of the pride. We reject any tone that I or you may somehow think we're better than us, anybody else because we've been in church so many years. Who we are begins with God. And we're all given all that we need to remain in the faith. Our identity as his children... Brothers and sisters of Jesus Christ comes from the water in baptism. It is shaped by the power of the Holy Spirit and trained with the scriptures. With an identity in Christ, we are turned away from any selfish sins and returned toward his way forward. That is the good news of Jesus in the gospel, and that always makes it happen. Not returning to the same old way, but the way of new life, new love, mercy, and grace. The ways of our God who will do anything to redeem and save you, including become truly human in the body of Jesus, suffering under Pontius Pilate, crucified on a Roman cross, bleeding, dying, and forgiving. His death brings life to everyone. His resurrected life creates an eternal life safely tucked away in heaven. So walking forward in faith like Prophet Jonah, we are the animated, moving body of Christ on earth and are called to exist, not for our own sakes, not just so we may experience God's love and mercy, and no one else, but rather so our very lives bubble up over with the gospel truth of that fountain of life that comes into our life, that can be enjoyed by every person we encounter, because we have so much more in common with others than we think. Everyone needs a life of faith and some hope in Jesus. It may not be our ideal calling, It might be hard. The enemies that we face might even be in our own church camps one day. We may not always be living the dream, but when it's God's dream, grace will grow us very good in the gospel. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And now may the peace of God, which goes beyond our human understanding, guard your hearts and lives in the one true faith in Jesus Christ, now and always. You may remain seated as the offerings are gathered.
Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for making us followers of Jesus. Turn us away from all sin and build our faith in him. Help us give ourselves wholeheartedly to our callings in the world and in the church. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for those who spread the gospel, pastors, teachers, evangelists, that they would have courage for their work and teach only the truth in love. Provide pastors for all your flock. Bless those studying for the public ministry and encourage those who are struggling with a call to serve you in this way. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for those who hear the gospel, that they would repent and believe in the time that you provide. Grow the seeds of your word that you have planted among the families of our parish, our communities, and places of learning. Help all to be witnesses of faith in their homes. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Have mercy, Lord, on those who are afraid of you and scared to open up the dark corners of their lives to your judgment and mercy. Help us all examine ourselves, receive your forgiveness, and be renewed by your Spirit. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Thank you for the many blessings we receive in Canada. Meet the needs of those who do not have enough for daily life and uphold this country in peace and prosperity. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for the sick and those near death whose appointed time has grown short. Bring all to call on you in the day of trouble and comfort them with your love. Be with those among us who are sick including Marilyn Tuber, Donna Hoffman's 12-year-old granddaughter, Violet, Aaron Pfeffer, Janice Mueller's nephew, Zach, Anne Schneikart, Tammy Granton, Jeff and Sue Knoll, and Sonia, Eric Hilwitson, who is Ray Anderson's son-in-law, we also pray for soul members, Anna, John, Pauline Honey, and John Repke. We pray for Emily and Rhoda, and we also pray for Marjorie. And we also pray for all those whom we know in our hearts. Lord, grant them relief in your own time and will. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, you have called us to follow your Son in repentance and trust. By your Holy Spirit, strengthen us when we are weary. Fill us with hope when we despair. And give us your light when we walk in darkness. For you alone are our rock and salvation. We ask this through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Taught by our Lord and trusting in his promises, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. 
his voice and keep his word. Amen. Thanks be to God. Jesus is the pathway that leads to life. May you follow in his narrow way. Amen. Praise be to God. Jesus is the vine and we are the branches. May you be rooted and grounded in his word and love. Amen. Glory be to our God. May the Almighty God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit bless and keep you now and always. Amen. We close with our last song, Fishers of Men. serving our Lord in peace and joy. Thanks. <laughs> 